I'm talking about this this whole week uh, that we've been meeting, Wednesday, last night, and tonight, that God has a problem. And the big problem that he is currently working on is the prevention of a third rise of sin. Sin has already happened twice in the universe. It happened with Lucifer and a third of his angels, and then it happened with Adam and Eve and this and their offspring. So God doesn't want any more sin. And this is why understanding the nature of sin and understanding the plan of salvation and how it all works is so wonderful. Now, let me make a point very clear. A lot of people will be saved who never understood the plan of salvation. Many people who've lived all down through the ages never heard about Jesus. In fact, do you know that the American Bible Society says that right tonight, there are almost 4 billion, that's with a B, 4 billion people living on this planet who have never heard the name of Jesus. That's awesome, isn't it? And at the rate the population of Earth is exploding, it getting the name of Jesus to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, humanly speaking, is impossible. We serve a wonderful God. And His salvation is not based on our knowledge of it. Rather, it is based on our response to His Spirit and to His two laws of love. Because the Gentiles, who don't know the law, when they, Paul says, when they do the things required of them in the law, they show that they are a law unto themselves. They have a conscience. They know right from wrong. And they, and they respond to the Spirit, and God says, hey, if they'll do that with the limited knowledge they have, I know they'll do that if I gave them more knowledge. I think that's so wonderful. What a marvelous God. What a marvelous God. Like I said the first night, a lot of XYZ people are going to be in heaven only to discover ABC. Okay. I was saying before we took our break that a person might go two days without sinning, but it is inevitable we will sin. Our carnal nature will leap out. It will ambush you. You will say something. You will do something that you did not intend to say or intend to do. It just happens. That's what Paul said. But now watch this. 1 John 1.8, John says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. However, in verse 9, 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins... Jesus is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You know, sin doesn't have dominion over the Christian. He may be a sinner, but he doesn't, he's not controlled by the sinful nature. And that's the beauty of following Christ and giving Christ your life. He sets you free of the sinful nature's control. That doesn't mean you're free of the sinful nature's ambush, but you're free of its control. If we claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar, and His Word has no place in our lives. 1 John 2.1, My dear children, John says, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But, if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. He lived here. He knows how, it, how things work down here. He's walked in our shoes as one of us. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. One. The only one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, 
but also for the sins of the whole world. If anyone sees, 1 John 5, 16, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, well, what kind of sin is that? That does not lead to death. He should pray, and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not saying we should pray about that. What is he saying here? Let me, let me go on and I'll come back. All wrongdoing is sin, John says, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. Well, what kind of sin is that? Let's get that worked out real quick so we can do it. The sin that does not lead to death is accidental sin. Not premeditated. Not intended. It just happened. It's an accident. The sin that leads to death is premeditated and willful. You understand the difference? All wrongdoing is sin. And there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. You can't keep on doing wrong after you know what right is. But the one who was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him. So what have we learned? Until the carnal nature is removed, everyone will sin. Accidental sins do not lead to death but they can produce some nasty results. Sin is still sin. And as that old gospel song says, sin will cost you more than you want to pay and take you farther than you want to go. Sin is still sin. All wrongdoing is sin. But accidental sins do not lead to death. Because the carnal nature cannot be totally subdued at this time, God plans to remove it from the living after they are judged. God is going to remove the law of sin, which wars against our spiritual nature, and in its place write his two laws in our hearts and minds. And so here's the deal. In every born-again heart, there is a wolf and a lamb. The wolf is the carnal nature, and the lamb is the spiritual nature. See, I stole this from Letty. Can I borrow this, Letty? I accidentally stole it. <laughs> if we feed the sinful nature, it becomes strongest. If we feed the spiritual nature, it becomes strongest. So which do we feed most? Do you find that you have no time to get into the Word to study? It's so easy to get our hands on junk food, the stuff that feeds the carnal nature. It is so easy to get busy and starve the spiritual nature. It is so easy to allow the cares of this life to rob us of getting enough spiritual food. Be careful, Jesus said, or the cares of this life will weigh you down. And that day will come upon you unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. During the Great Tribulation, God is going to test all of us, not to see if we're perfect or sinless, but to see if we truly love him first and most, and our neighbor as ourself. Jesus said in John 13, 34, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. See, this is new. No one has ever seen the kind of love that Jesus gave up and, and, and showered and bestowed upon us. Where else in earth's history has a God, an almighty God, come down from heaven, surrendered himself to the penalty for sin in our place? Love one another as almighty God has loved you. So you must love one another. This is a command. Not a suggestion. It is a command. 
By this, if you do this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. During the judgment of the living, Jesus will determine our destiny based on our actions because our actions will show what we love most. Luke 12, 29, Jesus said, And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink, and do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed and ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, Beverly. Like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Beverly and I were talking today at, out at the park about how difficult it is to share the gospel and to get people to interest it and to have them even listen and consider what you want to, the joy that just is exploding within you. It's just hard to find people that are willing to hear. And, and Beverly was just moved to tears that, she feels so frustrated and helpless. But I told her to keep her lamp burning because you never know when that opportunity will come. And it will. God will send opportunity if we seek opportunity. But we've got to be ready for it or what's the point of it? At this moment, God's constitution, the two eternal laws of the universe, have been written on two tablets of stone. These two tablets are called the Ten Commandments. In other words, the Ten Commandments are the two house rules of the universe simply restated by God for fallen man so that there can be no wiggle room by sinners when it comes to defining love. Love is not lust. Love is not sex. Love is not sexual immorality. Love is not emotion. Love is not indulgence. Love is not tolerance. Love is not a lot of things that fallen man claims love to be. God has defined his two laws in the form of ten commandments so that fallen man can see what love is and is not. Love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul. That is house rule number one. And house rule number one is explained on tablet number one the first four commandments. The first four commandments are man's duty to God. This love thy neighbor as thyself is tablet number two. That's commandments numbers six through ten. Five through ten, excuse me. Let's make that right. Five through ten. The Ten Commandments are prophetic. They reveal what informed people will do or not do when they truly love God and those around them as God desires. Paul understood this fact, and he wrote, Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans 13.10 Many people assure me that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross, made null and void, and put in the trash can. But, look at this. In Revelation eleven nineteen, the Bible says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened up. This is at the seventh trumpet. This is a future event. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. The ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Now here's the question. Why does God show the Ark of the Covenant at the end of the seventh trumpet 
if the covenant has been put in the trash can. Uh, incidentally, what is in the Ark of the Covenant? Uh, well, his covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. Look at this. Deuteronomy 4.12. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. Moses is talking to the children of Israel, and, and he's talking about Mount Sinai. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow, and then wrote them on two stone tablets. The Ten Commandments are called the covenant. Why are the Ten Commandments called a covenant? Well, there's a promise that goes with obeying God's two laws of love. And the promise is this. If you will obey my word, which will constantly push you into the two laws of love that govern the universe, I will be your protection and provider. How sweet is that? What else do you need? You've got everything you need. Protection and provision. Jesus said in Leviticus 26.3 to Israel, If you will follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will walk among you and, you will be, and, will be, and will be your God and you will be my people. But only if you do what? Follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands. The Ten Commandments are called a covenant because they are based on a promise. They are kept in a box that is called the Ark of the Covenant because this is the covenant. Trust and obey. And I will be your God and you will be my people. God says, obey my Ten Commandments because they will constantly challenge you to love me first and your neighbor as yourself. At the, first, at the seventh trumpet, Jesus is going to show the Ark of the Covenant to the world because contrary to what millions of Christians believe, the Ten Commandments, the Covenant, they were not nailed to the cross. The Ten Commandments are just as important today as they were the day that Jesus spoke them from Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments are the one witness of the two witnesses that can be seen. It is the, this witness that defines what love is and is not. The Ten Commandments are the two laws of the universe simply written on stone tablets for fallen man. Now, I want to say a few words about the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the Ten Commandments. Some people believe the Ark of the Covenant is still on earth and either has been or will be found. And for the following reasons, this is not possible. Claims of having found the Ark of the Covenant are false. And here's why. History indicates that Jeremiah hid the Ark as Nebuchadnezzar approached Jerusalem to do battle. As you know, many claim and counterclaim on the whereabouts of the Ark today exist. And to date, no one has produced the Ark or even shown pictures or any evidence of it. These claims and the absence of evidence places these claims in a category with the natural healing properties of snake oil. God took the ark to heaven during the Babylonian captivity so that he could show it to the people of earth at the close of the seventh trumpet. We just read from a Re Revelation 11:19 that the ark of the covenant is in heaven. We just read that. It is not on earth. And here are seven reasons. Think about this. During the Great Tribulation, travel and communication for ordinary people will be non-existent at worst and impossible at best. What would be the value of finding the Ark of the Covenant in or near Jerusalem during the Great Tribulation 
if only a few thousand people in the Middle East hear about it and only a few thousand get to see it. Other than local interest, what is the global impact of the two laws of the universe during the Great Tribulation? Zero. Number two, if prior to the Great Tribulation, suppose the Ark of the Covenant is found and put on display in a museum in Jer Jerusalem, it would be regarded not as the covenant of God, but a, as a historical relic. As a relic of the past, the Ark of the Covenant would not have or prove anything to anyone. If the Ark of the Covenant is merely regarded as an ancient treasure, what is the global impact of God's two great laws of the universe? Zero. It's just an artifact, a relic. Number three, if the Ark of the Covenant is found prior to the Great Tribulation, the Jews would immediately lay claim to the Ark and they would take possession of it and hide it in a secret place. Well, the net effect would be the same as right now. The Ark would remain hidden from view and worse, the religious property of the Jews. I say worse because most Christians think the Ten Commandments are Jewish laws anyway. But they're not. They're the two laws of the universe. They're one of the two witnesses. So what would be the global impact on the world? Zero. If the Ark of the Covenant was found prior to the Great Tribulation and no one was killed after touching it, as was Uzzah, this would prove that God's power did not rest on the Ark. This would prove that indeed the ark is only a relic. And this would give many Christians the proof they need that the Ten Commandments are nothing. They've just been thrown in the trash because these are Jewish laws and they were nailed to the cross. So again, so what would be the global impact if you touched it and nothing happened? Zero. Number five. The only people permitted to handle the ark of the covenant were the offspring of Aaron. You had to be a descendant of Aaron to carry the ark. Even an ordinary Levite could not touch the ark. So if the ark were found on earth prior to the great tribulation, who would move it? Would you? Who would handle it? If God's power still rests upon his holy law, if God's power does not rest upon the law which he wrote with his own finger, it's just a couple of interesting stone tablets and we're back to the issue of relic worship. Number six, if God took the ark to heaven because he plans to show it to the whole world at an appointed time, this is easily possible. If he took Enoch and Elijah to heaven, surely he can get a small box to heaven. We know from Revelation's context that when the ark is unveiled and shown to the world from heaven, the ark will not be regarded as a relic by any scoffer. In fact, the ark of the covenant, which contains the two tablets of stone, will be a divine display from the lawmaker himself, written with his own finger condemning all who refused to submit to the terms and condition, conditions of his covenant of love. A brilliant ark with two stone tablets blazing in the sky will be an eerie and awesome sight for the universe and billions of people to gaze upon. A display of the ark will confirm the faith of the obedient and it will condemn the wicked who will shiver with guilt. God's covenant with mankind is trust and obey for there is no other way. Conversely, God's covenant also says defy and die for there is no other way to live happily ever after. Showing the ark to everyone on earth will be an awesome event 
What will be the global impact at the seventh trumpet? Huge. A museum piece hidden under a blanket thousands of miles away from billions of people means nothing. Number seven, Jesus delivered the Ten Commandments himself. He came from heaven himself and spoke the law himself. It was that important. He spoke it with such power and majesty that the Jews were scared to death. And they said to Moses, you go talk to him or lest we die. A Mount Sinai experience is coming again. Again. The same thing will happen again, except it will be a global experience. When the law is shown, the lawgiver will speak his law and his covenant, and the saints will rejoice because the law is sealed in their hearts and in their minds. They're in perfect conformity with the two laws of the universe, and they've been sealed in that condition forever and ever. The wicked will shiver with guilt. This is the law they refuse to receive. This is the law they refuse to obey. And the great lawgiver, Almighty God, is going to now take care of business. By the way, number eight, the two tablets of stone placed in the Ark of the Covenant were written by Jesus himself. And this makes the Ten Commandments in the Ark of the Covenant that originally was on earth originals, not copies. The Ark of the Covenant in heaven is the original built by Moses and it will be unveiled and shown to the whole world at the appointed time. God himself will show mankind what he thinks of his two laws. This is why the Ark of the Covenant cannot be on earth. Does that make sense to you? Okay. I want to shift gears now. I have said um, about everything I need to say about the two witnesses. I want to shift gears entirely and start a train of thought that we'll carry over into tomorrow in our final uh, seminar segments. And um, I want to uh, discuss with you for a few minutes the importance of 1994. Before I do that, I want to, I want to um, dr uh, draw a little picture for you on the uh, screen here. And I want to try to show and explain something to you. This is a timeline. And let's say that this is 1994. And let's say that um, here we are in 2009. This is today. And that the commencement of the uh, Great Tribulation is going to be right here. And let's just choose a number at random like August 2011. Now, I don't know that the Great Tribulation is going to begin in August 2011. I'm just offering that for your consideration, okay? So we've got, let's say, a couple of years prior to the commencement of the Great Tribulation. Now, this is something I want you to consider. God's patience with earth ran out in 1994. At the end of 70 Jubilee cycles. In other words, after 3,430 years, allowing uh, 30 Jubilee cycles um, for Israel and 40 uh, Jubilee, uh, 40 uh, cycles for the Gentiles, 70 cycles in all, God's patience with earth ran out, let's say, in 1994. Just, I want you to consider it. I'm not asking you to accept it. Just give it uh, some thought. And so God's patience uh, ran out, and at that time, he gave seven trumpets 
to seven angels who minister before his throne. Now, these trumpets uh, are instruments uh, that will mark the outpouring of God's wrath in sequential steps. So when trumpet number one sounds in heaven, we won't hear it, of course, but it will sound in heaven, heaven's temple, and there will be a corresponding event on earth, and the first trumpet is a great hailstorm that's going to, uh, of fiery meteors that are going to burn up a third of the earth. And then the second trumpet will sound, and there will be a great asteroid impact, and this asteroid impact is going to hit perhaps the Pacific Ocean, and the tsunami that results is going to clean up the ring of fire. It'll wash all the coastal cities away that, that sit on the Pacific Ocean. Maybe it's the Atlantic Ocean. I don't know which ocean, but it'll be a great ocean. And then the third trumpet will sound, and another asteroid will hit a continent and a landmass, and this is going to tear up the geological strata, and it's going to contaminate the aquifers beneath. People are going to drink contaminated water thousands of miles away from the impact zone, and there's going to be enormous death caused by it. And then there's the fourth trumpet that will sound, and great darkness is going to cover a th the middle third of the earth, and this darkness was likely to be caused by volcanic uh, volcano eruptions. The ejecta and the soot will fill the, the heavens, blocking the sunlight. The, 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 the light will be so, um, the, the ejecta will be so dense that light cannot come through it, and crops will fail, and global famine will immediately follow. So these trumpets are serious, deadly judgments. And let's suppose, for the sake of illustration, that God's patience ran out with earth at a point in time, and let's say 1994, and at that time he gave these seven trumpets to the seven angels. And the first four angels came to earth and were prepared and ready to do their deadly work, but they were told to wait. Immediately they were told to wait. They were, could not proceed. They were told to wait until what should happen until the 144,000 should be selected and they are the first ones to be sealed. They are the first ones to have their carnal nature removed. So we've been in a waiting pattern since 1994. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting for the wrath of God to break loose. And let's suppose that the wrath of God and the seven trumpets began in 2011. So several things now would make sense if you're interested in putting the Bible story together. Let me take you to the Bible here for a second and take you to Revelation 8 verse 2 and look at this verse first. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and to them were given seven trumpets. When did that happen? Let's suppose it happened in 1994. Okay? The seven angels who stand before God were given seven trumpets in, in 1994. Okay? Now let's go back to Revelation 7, verse 1. John says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to do what? What are these four angels going to do? They're going to hurt, harm the land and the sea and the trees. And then this angel says to these four, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Now, here's the question. Do not harm 
the land or the sea or the trees until we do what? Put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Okay, we've been waiting so far 15 years. So far we've been waiting 15 years uh, by this illustration. How much longer will it be before the 144,000 are selected and sealed? Well, I can't precisely answer the question, but let me show you what I think may be is an answer to the question, or at least an approach to the question. Here's the timeline. Here's 1994. Here's 2011, let's say. And let's suppose here's 2015. Let's suppose the distance between 2011 and 2015 is 1,335 days, going here from August until April. Okay? The reason that I say that this is possible is because it's very likely that somewhere around here, the 6,000th year of sin occurs. It's very likely the 6,000th year is somewhere, as best I can tell, it can't be much further, I don't think it can be any further than the year 2017. But my best guess is that the 6,000th year of sin is in the year 2015. It, and, and it ends in April of 2015. Why is that important? Well, I believe that the weekly cycle represents the 7,000 years that God has determined the existence of sin. And this Sabbath millennium of 1,000 years, the saints will spend in heaven. The 1,000 years of Revelation 20 are not just a random number. No, God has set this all up very deliberately because a day with the Lord is as a 1,000 years. And as I calculated, coming down through the genealogies from Adam to Noah, 1,656 years, then from the time of Noah to the time of Abraham, from the time of Abraham to the Exodus with Moses, and then from the Exodus in 1437 B.C. to 1994, it all adds up. The 6,000th year, the latest it can be, as I calculated, around 2015. So, if it is true that the... Seven angels were given seven trumpets in 1994, and they've been waiting for the selection and sealing of the 144,000, and we are here at this point and haven't seen anything yet, and there's 1,335 days between 2011 and 2015. Aha, we're very close. Let me show you something else. Try to get that straightened up for you. Now I'm going to have to zoom in to show you something here. Okay. God created four types of prophetic signposts for the benefit of the final generation. Now watch this carefully. God gave us, as signpost number one, the rise and fall of world empires by name. So I'm going to move my chart over here. And you can see the empire of Babylon and Daniel 2 lasted for 66 years. And the Medo-Persian empire lasted for 208 years. And the Grecian Empire lasted 163 years. And the Roman Empire lasted 644 years. And then the feet 
the period represented by the feet of the metal man has lasted 1530 years up to 1994. So all that's left are the ten toes which will occur during the time of the Great Tribulation and then the 1,000 years of the Sabbath millennium where the saints reign with Christ in heaven. So looking at this just uh, politically, the rise and fall of nations, God has given us a progression, a signpost, if you will, indicating the order of events. Okay, let's go now and look at the second signpost that God has given us. The perfect timing of Messiah's death. Jesus died precisely on time in the middle of the 70th week. In A.D. 30. April 7, A.D. 30. Friday, Jesus died and was resurrected on Sunday, April 9, A.D. 30. And you know, there are two witnesses that prove that date beyond any reasonable argument. And you know what the two witnesses are? There's actually more than two, but the two that you can't argue with are the sun and the moon. That's right. Because astronomers can position the sun and the moon to precisely show that the history as recorded in the Gospels will only work out during the A.D. 30. A.D. 31 will not work. A.D. 29 will not work. A.D. 34, 33, 37, none of those will work. The days of the week will not line up with the sun and the moon. Only A.D. 30, which happens to be the middle of the 70th week. It's very interesting. I mean, right on time. Even the sun and moon testify to it. So we have the death of Jesus right on time. That shows us where the 70 weeks have to lie. 457 B.C. down through 33 A.D. But that also picks up this larger prophecy of the 2300 years, which began in 457 B.C. and reaches down to 1844. Okay? Okay? So that's the, uh, the importance of this signpost is that the judgment of the dead, which began in 1844, the security of that date is built on the death of Jesus being right on time because the, the chart actually comes backwards and then back around this way and all the way down to 1844. There's no wiggle room. I mean, it's precise down to the second. Well, let's go back here and look at the third signpost. God has given us five huge prophetic time periods that cannot be moved. Okay, let's look over here. Seventy weeks. The seventy weeks can't be moved. We know exactly where they lie. We know the 2300 years can't be moved. We know exactly where they are. We know the 1260 years of the little horn power in Daniel 7. We know exactly where, that, where they lie. So when we put these together, we'll, along with the thousand years of Revelation 20, which is a huge time period, prophetic time period that can't be moved around, and when we add to this the Jubilee calendar, which is 3,430 years in length, wow, we're out of wiggle room. We're out of wiggle room. And that brings me to this point number four, that God has given us the hint in his use of the weekly cycle, a 7,000-year limit for the duration of sin. The coming millennium will be a Sabbath of rest for the land. You see, when Jesus comes... He's going to, to, to destroy the wicked with a sword that comes out of his mouth. It's actually a command, but it's personified in Revelation as a sword that comes out of his mouth. And he just speaks, and the dead and, and, the, and the wicked drop dead. And the Bible says in Revelation 19, the birds are going to eat their flesh. The birds are looking forward to this picnic. All you can eat. 
Now, when Jesus comes, he's going to resurrect the righteous dead. And then the Bible says the righteous living are going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And then they're going to return to the holy city where they will spend the thousand years. Jesus said in John 14, 1, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I live, you can live too. So Jesus is coming to take us home. That means earth is going to be left vacant, desolate, nobody home. You see, God has determined that this old wicked world, this world that, that languishes under the curse of sin, will have a Sabbath rest for 1,000 years. And that is the Sabbath millennium. Now, okay, I believe that we are very near, perhaps a couple of years at the most. It could be any time. Jesus did say at an hour when you think not. Did he not? So it could be any time. I'm just giving you my best guess. I'm guessing we are very close to the commencement of the Great Tribulation. And I'm going to, I'm out of time. I'm not going to. In the morning, I will begin by showing you why that I believe that this is so close that we can almost touch it. It is at the door. And I believe that one of the key ingredients in this matter is the nuclear, the, the, the likelihood of nuclear war. I will explain that if you will come back in the morning at about 10 o'clock. Are there any other announcements I should make? 10 o'clock in the morning from 10 till noon, and then we'll, we'll resume about 1.30 with a little visitation and answers and questions, and, and then the fi final uh, study, and we'll be done by about 4 o'clock. Let's stand for the benediction. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your precious word. And for the precious warning that you are giving us to prepare us, to encourage us, and to inspire us, and to help us see the big picture, because we know that we have nothing to fear if we walk side by side with you. We have nothing to fear except that we forget how you have led us in the past. We know that you love us, you have paid the price for our salvation. We know that there's everything to, to look forward to. And yes, tomorrow may look very dim. The Great Tribulation is not an exciting thought. But we know that it will be the worst of times and the best of times at the same time. And we look forward to the great harvest of souls and the great ingathering that you're going to, to achieve through a marvelous sequence of events. Thank you for being such a God of love and upholding the laws of love. We want those laws written in our hearts that we might glorify you and bring joy and happiness to our neighbor. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Well, good night and may God bless you. And we'll see you in the morning at 10 o'clock.